India is racist and happy about it. That's the tagline to uh, the article that I've written um, in Outlook. A black American's first-hand experience of footpath India. No one even wants to change. Okay. In spite of friendship and love in private spaces, the Delhi public literally, literally stops and stares. It is harrowing to constantly have children and adults tease, taunt, pick, poke, and peer at you from the corner of their eyes, denying their own humanity as well as mine. Their aggressive, crude curiosity threatens to dominate unless disarmed by kindness or met with equal aggression. Once I stood gazing at the giraffes at the Lucknow Zoo, only to turn and see 50-odd families gawking at me rather than the exhibit. Parents abruptly withdrew infants that inquisitively wandered towards me as kids do. I felt like an exotic African creature come spectacle, steering fear and awe. Even my attempts to grow the public through simple greetings or smiles are often not reciprocated. Instead, the look of wonder swells as if this were all a part of the act and we're all just playing our parts. Racism is never a personal experience. Racism in India is systematic and independent of the presence of foreigners of any hue. This climate permits and promotes this lawlessness and disdain for dark skin. Most Indian pop icons have light, damn near white skin. Several stars even promote skin bleaching creams that promise to improve one's popularity and career success. And I showed uh, one of the articles right here. This is John Abraham, one of the you know biggest stars in India. Shah Rukh Khan does the same thing. They're promoting these fairness creams. Even has a fairness meter. Matrimonial ads boast of fair, very fair, and very, very fair skin alongside foreign visas and advanced university degrees. Moreover, each time I visit one of Delhi's clubhouses, I notice that I'm the darkest person not wearing a work uniform. It's unfair and ugly. Discrimination in Delhi surpasses the denial of courtesy. I've been denied visas, apartments, entrances to discos, attentiveness, kindness, and the benefit of doubt. Further, the lack of neighborliness exceeds what locals describe as normal for a capital already known for its coldness. My partner is white and I am black, facts of which the Indian public reminds us daily. Bank associates have denied me chai, that's tea, while falling over to please my white friend. Mall shop attendants have denied me attentiveness while mobbing my partner. Who knows what else is more quietly denied? Who knows exactly what else I just don't see that is denied? An African has come, a god announced over the intercom as I showed up. Whites are afforded the luxury of their own names, but this careful attention to my presence was not new. ATM guards stand and salute my white friend. <laughs> Literally, they see him coming, they're like, Sir, stop. While one guard actually asked me why I had come to the bank machine, as if I might have said that I was taking over his shift. It is shocking that people wear liberalism as a sign of modernity, yet revert to ultra conservatism when actually faced with difference. Cyber bullies have threatened my life on my YouTube videos that capture local gawking and eve teasing. I was even fired from an international school for talking about homosociality in Africa on YouTube and addressing a class of students about homophobia um, against kids after a student called me a fag. I have a whole video about that incident. And that was at the American school here. Outside of specific anchors of discourse, such as reservations, and that's affirmative action in India, reservations for the um, um, oppressed caste and um, tribal groups, and there's a, a whole list of groups. So outside of these anchors of discourse, there is no consensus that discrimination is a redeemable social ill. This is the real issue with discrimination in India. Our own citizens suffer, and we are only encouraged to ignore situations that make us feel powerless. Powerless. Ignore it. Nothing you can do. Eh, throw some money in it. Be it the mute witnesses seeing racial difference for the first time, kids learning racism from their folks, or the blacks and northeasterners who feel victimized by the public 
Few operate from a position that believes in change. Living in India was a childhood dream that deepened with my growing understanding of India and America's unique shared history of nonviolent revolution. And you better believe that's something that few people on this planet can say that they have actively and actually participated in. Nonviolent revolution. And I'll get back to why that's really important to India and America. Yet, in most nations, the path of ending gender, race, and class discrimination is unpaved. In India, this path is still rural and rocky, as if this nation has not decided the road even worthy. If it is a footpath that we are left to tread individually, racism is a footpath that we are left to tread individually. What I wanted to say about what's interesting about India and America's shared history of nonviolence is that, A, it is a basic understanding that the, developed, the developing world is largely decolonized because of Gandhi. Because we saw it work in India. In 40, by 48, these people were like, you know, I India. And consequently, you know, um, Ghana took 10 years. But Ghana in uh, 59, Nigeria, you know, all these African nations were decolonized, or decolonized after saying this. And what is interesting is look at the number of Indian professionals that are in the United States as a result of the civil rights that was led and won largely by African Americans in collaboration and cooperation with many, many uh, sympathetic to the cause of peace and justice. So it's, it's another way that India and America are tied. I mean, if you look at the Indian diaspora, and this is very much um, particularly what came in the 60s and 70s, cherry-picked um, by, by white people, by the white people in power in our nation. And this is the same thing that was done all over East Africa, through the Caribbean with Indians who are cherry-picked. We want these Indians to go there and be our buffer. Our. Whose buffer? Against them. And um, Indians have been, in many ways, um, played like pawns. And so it is harmful um, today in the United States to see, you know, brown, educated people who um, denied that racism existed um, or deny that they were, were in any way powerful to speak out about it, to do something about it, to, to decolonize their own minds. And so when I talk about this powerlessness that people feel about racism, I don't even think that people even realize the power in the power in, in, in words and saying that even if this is a prevailing ideology in the world, this will not be in any space that I share. I will not let my kids, you know, relearn this. I will not let anybody that comes near me um, that comes in my space, you know, live in those ideas. And so it's particularly harmful when people uh, don't want to talk about racism. People act like, oh, just, you know, give it up. There's nothing to talk about. There's nothing you do. What can you do? People laugh all the time. Why talk about racism? Or when you're talking about it, people say that you're just complaining. And I take serious issue with that because words are power. Now, there are words that are draining, and that, that is complaining. But then to talk about something and to say, I'm not going to let it occupy that space of oppression in my life, but I'm going to determine that it occupies a space of powerfulness. It will not make me feel powerless. It will not make me reside to step back further and further and further from feeling, from acknowledging even my own hurt, even those times that I do feel powerless. If I don't recognize those, then how will I recognize when I truly embrace power? Otherwise, I could just be angry and pissed off and, and feel powerful. That's not power. That's just rage. And so I'm really happy that this is an ongoing discussion. Tomorrow I'm meeting with Al Jazeera, and they're going to talk to me about these things. And I'm really going to start with love. There are Africans and Indians who love each other. There are Afro-Indian couples, Afro-Indian children. And I really like to focus more on that than the Afro-Indian disparities, the Afro-Indian hate. And there is so much of that. We only, again, we only need to look at where African and Indian people have to share a space. And we can see that there are many areas for improvement. But I'm telling you, our legacy is the bomb. We can do it, y'all. Cooperation. Uh. Close the door.